Magandang umaga, Filipinas. Good morning. You're watching Eagle News Mornings from Canada. I'm Thomas I. Likeness, reporting from our Eagle News studio in the western Canadian province of Alberta. My city is Edmonton, and uh, we're here to bring you news and commentary from across the country. Well, we're into the final stretch of the week, almost at the end, Thursday morning, and time to check the weather. Thank you, weather telling us we should reach a high today of about 35 degrees with a real feel of 40. Thunderstorm or two this afternoon. Another thunderstorm forecast for this evening. Right now we've got a few clouds and 28 degrees. It feels like 34. Now the air quality a little bit better than yesterday, but still I'd, uh, you know, if, if you got breathing problems, stay inside. It's, it's rated as fair today, so it is a little bit better. Brewed and just, an, uh, just finished brewing another cup of coffee, I should say. And, uh, Now's the time to grab that second cup, sit back, relax, and let me tell you what's happening in Canada. First, we'll look at the weather across the country, and our street scene today comes from Victoria, the capital of British Columbia. And a big thank you to Aisha Duazo for our street scene. And as we look across Canada, mostly cloudy and 22 in Victoria, I can see actually uh, it looks like those clouds have dissipated according to our street scene there. Vancouver, mostly cloudy in 19 in uh, Alberta. Uh, Edmonton, partly cloudy, 22. Light rain in Calgary in 17. Uh, in Saskatchewan, Regina is mostly cloudy, very, very hot there, 30 degrees. Up in Saskatoon, they've got light rain in 23. Winnipeg, mainly sunny in 24. Toronto, mostly cloudy in 20. Ottawa has cooled down quite a bit from yesterday. Uh, partly sunny sky there in 21. Montreal, also considerably cooler than yesterday, mostly cloudy in 24. Now, as we move east to Atlantic Canada, uh, still uh, still lots of sunshine, uh, lots of heat there. Fredericton uh, has some clouds, 26. Halifax, lots of sunshine, 26. And up at St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, they've got clouds, but the temperature got up to 27 degrees today. Let's look at weather in Canada. Here are some of the stories we're following today. Scammers launch, launch a fake COVID-19 contact tracing app. A former Supreme Court judge says Canada should discontinue court proceedings against a Huawei executive. Travel restrictions in Atlantic Canada have been eased, and Ontario wants to uh, make sure temporary farm workers are tested for COVID-19. Well, you know, it seems scammers Never sleep. Your latest target? Canada's COVID-19 tracing app. You know, that app isn't even out yet, and they're scamming people. You recall last week, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, announced a nationwide tracing app, and he encouraged people, when it was available, to download it on their smartphones. But the app hasn't even been rolled out yet. Uh, actually, they don't expect it to be around until next month, and even then, available only for testing in Ontario. Did that stop the hackers? Not on your life. They've been busy. ESET, they're a cybersecurity company in Slovakia. ESET says two fake websites that look like official Canadian government sites have been advertising a COVID-19 tracing app. And, and they're saying this is endorsed by Health Canada. So, you know, people look at it and they figure, why not? I mean, it's, it, it looks like a government website. Well, these bogus sites, they've been taken down now. Unfortunately, what people downloaded contains some computer ransomware. You know what ransomware is. you got to pay to get the use of your device back. But this ransomware is known as CryCryptor. Uh, it was embedded in the fake app. And, and what it does is it gets into your phone, gets into all of your personal files on your phone, and it encrypts them. Now you haven't got any access to them. Well, how do you get access? Well, there's a message also that is sent to you. You're told to email the attacker where you can uh, discuss recovery. You know what that means. You're going to be paying for it. So be careful what you download. And like I said, for any of our Canadian listeners or any of you who might be talking to people in Canada, those two websites have been taken down. But beware, the, the official app hasn't been released yet. So anybody who says they got one, they don't. A former Supreme Court judge in Canada says the Canadian government has the authority 
to halt the extradition of a Huawei executive. Louise Arbour says the government should do that as part of the efforts to secure the release of the two Michaels. You recall they're the two Canadian men who've been detained in China. Former diplomat Michael Kovrig and businessman Michael Spavor have been in custody almost a year and a half. They were arrested in Beijing back in December of 2018, and their arrest came just days after Meng Wanzhou was taken off a plane in Vancouver and arrested on an American warrant, that warrant alleging that she sold uh, uh, technology to Iran, which breached American sanctions. So the Americans want us to extradite her back to the states where they can take court action. Uh, we're kind of caught in the middle of this. And and this Supreme Court judge is saying, no, we, we this is not our problem. It's, it's China's problem. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has rejected proposals that that this whole thing be dropped uh, in exchange for the repatriation of the two Canadians. He's saying, no, the, the judiciary has to be independent. But again, Arbor stresses the allegations against Ming are an American problem, not Canada's. We should just stay out of it. The four Atlantic provinces in eastern Canada, well, they've opened up their borders to each other now. Interprovincial travel is now being allowed between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland. These four provinces had the lowest outbreaks of COVID-19 in the country. Now, part of their success can be attributed to their move to close the borders to outsiders very early in the game. And even people from neighboring provinces, they were treated like they came from a foreign country. They had to quarantine, they had to self-quarantine for 14 days. So that essentially kept everybody out of the province, kept uh, the virus from coming into the province. Unlike visitors from other parts of Canada, people living in those four provinces now can travel back and forth across the boundaries. They don't have to self-isolate. The province hopes that easing the restrictions will boost tourism because their tourism has been hard hit. People can't come there, of course. They, they hope some of those losses will be offset. Public health officials, though, remaining cautious. They still warn, you know, COVID-19 remains a threat. Just because the restrictions are lifted doesn't mean the virus went away. Now, in my province, Alberta, our chief medical officer of health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, well, she's still advising us don't travel too far. No change to our official recommendation, which is that uh, non-essential travel outside of Alberta should be avoided at this time. Again, that's something that we continue to have conversations with our partners in other provinces about, but that's our current recommendation. So I guess we'll be sticking pretty close to home this summer, but you know, there's oh, a whole lot of things to do here in Alberta, all kinds of sights to see. So we'll be traveling Alberta. Alberta is also investing $10 million in a different type of testing for COVID-19. The government wants serology tests to be done. So what's this different about this type of testing? What is, is it all about? How does it differ from swab testing? You know, we, we're, we're currently swab testing people. Alberta Health Minister Tyler Shandro says the two tests measure different things. He says the swab test will indicate if a person currently has the infection. You can tell if they're infected from the results of the swab test. Now, Shandro says a serology test well, it's looking at the past. We know that there are people who've been infected and were never tested. Many of them simply because they never got sick. And that's where serology testing comes in. It detects the presence of antibodies in a person's blood, which can show us if they've been exposed to COVID-19 in the past. And that shows us more about how the virus is spreading and how best to contain it. Serology testing is a big step forward, but we also need to be clear about what it doesn't do. It does not, and I repeat not, replace swab testing. Now this testing will be done in four voluntary health studies, two of them involving children, two with adults. We haven't looked at the numbers across Canada for a few days. Almost 102,000 cases of COVID-19 since the pandemic began. Well over 8,400 people have died. Most of them were seniors in nursing homes. About 65,000 people have recovered so far. 
In Ontario, the provincial government has expanded coronavirus testing on farms in southern parts of the province. Mobile testing units are being sent out to the farms, uh, and these farms, you know, are employing thousands of temporary workers. An outbreak on several farms earlier this month prompted Mexico to ban people from coming to Canada for seasonal work. Three Mexican nationals died of COVID-19. Mexican government uh, was critical of the lack of safety procedures and days later after after they banned people days later they reversed that decision after Canada made some commitments to beef up safety and improve living conditions. Ontario Premier Doug Ford says uh, workers should not fear the consequences if they test positive. Send a clear message to the temporary workers. No one will lose their job if you have COVID-19. No one will be sent home if you have COVID-19. And if you test positive for COVID-19 and you need to self-isolate for 14 days, you will be eligible for WSIB uh, benefits. And in some cases, if you worked here last year and you have a social insurance number, workers may be eligible for the federal SERB benefits. Ford says in some circumstances, new public health guidelines will allow some workers who've been tested positive to actually continue working. I also under, understand that our farmers are often on the seasonal schedule, and this is one of their busiest times of the year. They need the extra help, and unlike other professions, most of it is outdoors and isolated. So to further support our farmers, the third pillar of our plan is a new public health guidance for asymptomatic workers. This guidance was developed in consultation with Dr. Williams and his team of experts. This new protocol will give farmers guidance on isolating workers who have tested positive for COVID-19, but who have no symptoms and who can still safely work outdoors in isolation. Still to come, help for the less fortunate in Toronto. Planning for the new school year this fall in Ontario is underway. Good morning if you're joining us. It's coming up on 17 minutes past 7 o'clock. Uh, you're watching Eagle News Mornings from Canada. Patindi ng patindi at tuloy-tuloy ang pagpapakita ng galing ng ating mga TNG aspirants. Abangan ng kanilang performances sa pinakamalaking talent competition sa buong bansa, Tagisan ng Galing. Gisan ng Galing is presented by SMC Infrastructure, Building a Better World. Sandig Sugar-Free White Coffee, puno ng white coffee taste without the sugar, kaya lower calories. Try mo na, Sandig Sugar-Free White Coffee, sarap ng white coffee, now sugar-free. VetaBrew Nutritious, the only premium dog food with active boost for optimum energy and prebiotics that help strengthen immunity. Just like Katrin Bernardo, going listo, ganado ang fur babies niyo. Listo ganado sa Nutritious, Magnolia Chicken Templados, delicious, ready to cook and freshly marinated daily. Pure Foods Lunch and Meat, pure sarap for every family. Star Chunky Cheese Corn Beef, ang cheesy ng corn beef mo. Walang duda, kids can tell na number one ang Pure Foods Standard juicy, ang tender, ang juicy, ang sarap. Co-presented by Cooper, expert in air conditioning and electromechanical. Also engaged in structural, electrical, fire protection, plumbing, and sanitary services. Cooper, your ultimate MEPS and air conditioning solutions. Ulan Incorporated International, fight against global poverty. New San Jose Builders Incorporated. Canrib Corporation, your ventilation and air conditioning specialist. Vita Herbs Philippines Green Coffee, masarap, mabango, at healthy pa. Puerto Rico Resort and Convention Center, Cabiao Nueva Ecija. I love Puerto Rico. In participation with Rain or Shine Elastomeric Waterproofing Paint, Matinko. R Square Variables Incorporated, Compizel Enterprises, SciShow International Trading Corporation, DN Steel, EMAC UPB Roof Corporation. Hey, Gretchen Ho here, and I'm a white coffee lover. 
creamy kasi and very yummy. Pero mas masarap kung hindi nakaka-guilty. Check my new discovery, San May Sugar-Free White Coffee. Puno ng white coffee taste without the sugar, kaya lower calories. Try mo na! San May Sugar-Free White Coffee. Sarap ng white coffee, now sugar-free. The Bulacan Bulk Water Project is a treatment facility that will provide bulk water to the 24 municipalities of Bulacan to meet the increasing water demand of its residents. Through concessionaire, SMC Infrastructure also initiated the significant improvements of the Manila North Harbor Port, the country's busiest port. Listo at ganado ang baby ko sa VET-approved Nutri-Chugs. With active boost and prebiotics na pampalisto. Made with real meat, with essential nutrients to help them grow healthy and happy. Listo, ganado sa Nutri-Chugs. Ikaw lang ang star ng buhay ko. Para sa akin, perfect ka. Ibang klase ang sarap ng corned beef mo. Ang cheesy ng corned beef mo. Pag star chunky cheese corned beef, sarap ng corned beef, inangat pa ng real cheese cubes. Kaya perfect ang sarap. Star chunky cheese corned beef. This is Eagle News Mornings from Canada. I'm Thomas I. Likeness. 21 minutes past 7 o'clock. 29 degrees in Metro Manila this morning. In Toronto, the city's mayor has found nearly $5 million extra dollars in the city's wallet. And as, as Eagle News correspondent Sabrina Solano de los Reyes tells us, that money will be used to help the less fortunate. On June 23rd, Toronto Mayor John Tory announced that about $4.97 million will be given to community-based agencies that support vulnerable populations impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Here's Mayor Tory with the announcement. So to assist those vulnerable populations in particular, we are announcing today that approximately $4.97 million from the TO Supports Investment Fund will be allocated towards community-based agencies who are supporting vulnerable residents that have been impacted upon by the COVID-19 pandemic. The TO Supports Investment Fund was created for the purpose of investing in partnerships with uh, social service agencies to help uh, support the urgent needs of Toronto's most vulnerable residents. The money will be invested in community-based agencies that partnered with the City of Toronto in the following eight areas. Housing and homelessness, food access and security, family support, mental health support, income support, social connection, community sector support, and community well-being. The funding will focus on agencies that are supporting Black, Indigenous, and Asian communities. In the upcoming weeks, the funds will cover mental health support through enhanced phone support, the distribution of culturally appropriate meals and food hampers, baby food, traditional medicines, hygiene kits, and Wi-Fi hotspots, amongst others. Deputy Mayor and Chair of Economic Development and Culture Committee, Michael Thompson, joined Mayor Tory in his press conference to talk about the successful establishments of several food programs. Take a look. This joint effort has led to the establishment of the food hamper program the mayor's mentioned, a temporary food bank, pop-up food banks, and the distribution of grocery gift cards to Toronto students and their families. Collaboration has also enabled us to implement our mental health support strategy to help connect residents to free mental health services during the pandemic. Our partnership with community-based agencies is essential to the success of these initiatives. And we've committed to continue supporting these organizations as they provide valuable services to residents through this difficult period. Mayor Tory stated that he is confident that this funding and partnerships will help address the immediate needs of vulnerable people and communities in our city. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, Toronto continues to prioritize aiding vulnerable communities so that during the following stages of reopening, no Torontonian is left behind. In Toronto, Sabrina Solano de los Reyes, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. 
Well, still in Ontario, the provincial government is looking ahead to the new school year. Eagle News correspondent Ashley Sackmeyer tells us that several different scenarios are being considered. The Ontario government released its school safety plan for this coming school year, with the health, safety and well-being of staff and students at its core. This announcement came two days after the SickKids Hospital released a report that recommended schools to reopen this September, largely due to the low risk of children contracting COVID-19. Premier Doug Ford emphasized that not all plans will look the same across the province. Take a look. We simply can't provide a blanket solution for the whole province. Instead, we need to provide school boards the tools and the guidelines to get the kids back in the classroom. We need to empower the school boards to make decisions based on their local needs, their local challenges, and their local priorities. Over the past few weeks, we've worked with our Chief Medical Officer of Health, our command table, and the experts at Sick Kids to develop guidelines for school boards to help them prepare to reopen schools in the fall. There are three different scenarios that schools can apply this September, keeping in mind that different communities will have different needs. Minister of Education Stephen Lecce explains it here. We are tasking school boards in Ontario to produce three plans to prepare for any circumstance that gets thrown at us as a problem. Number one, a plan for the return to regular in-class instruction with strict health and safety protocols. The second plan is a plan for the continuation of remote learning by strengthening the use of live online synchronous learning and instruction and creating creating greater standardization of that approach. And finally, a plan, uh, an adapted delivery model that blends the in-class instruction with online learning. It would include alternate days or weeks and staggered bells so that class sizes do not exceed no more than 15 students within them. Ontario has pledged to spend $736 million more on education for the upcoming school year. This budget will go towards mental health funding, cleaning supplies, including extra hand sanitizer and soap in schools, and other essential items. In-class lessons will remain voluntary. Minister Lecce states that it is ultimately the parents' choice whether or not their kids will be physically attending their classes. Take a look. We've announced that parents will have a choice for online or in-class delivery. We've announced that the province is investing an additional $730 million in net investments to ensure that the restart in September is positive. More money for mental health. More money announced with, uh, today for technology, for cleaning. We've set out clear health protocols, part of today's announcement, to guide school boards and give expectations to parents transparently on what those cleaning protocols will be and what the general protocol for the return to school will be. The school safety plan will be closely monitored during the month of September. Should the number of COVID-19 cases decrease, it will be up to the school boards to decide whether they will move towards going back to a traditional in-class school week or if they will remain as a mix of in-class and online learning. Schools do much more than just provide education. They also provide opportunities for social interaction. Nevertheless, it is understood that the safety measures put in place are necessary to protect the health of the children and that the choice of whether or not children will physically be in the classroom is respected. In Toronto, Ashley Sackmar, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. The Toronto Film Festival is going ahead in September despite the pandemic. Not going to be as large as it has been in the past. Only 50 new feature films will be in the lineup. It's the 45th year this has been going on. The festival will run from September 10th to September 19th. Organizers say the red carpets will be virtual this year. Far fewer movies will be premiered. Uh, usually they have three to 400 feature movies. Uh, uh, they're going to show them in uh, local theaters, but there's going to be social distancing in effect there and drive-ins as well. And for the first time it's in, in its history, the festival will also uh, feature a digital platform to show the movies. Press screenings as well will be digital. 
EBC is the home of wholesome, entertaining, and informative programs. Programs like Daily Insight with Mayanne Garzon and Randy Bernardino make Daily Insight your source of the latest news in business and technology. The program features inspirational stories behind small and medium enterprises and useful advice for starting your own business. Daily Insight, you can find it on Facebook and YouTube. That's our program for today on behalf of the Canadian News Team. I wish you all good health. Take care of others. Take care of yourselves. Stay home, stay safe, and stay tuned to Eagle News for accurate and balanced coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic and current affairs. I'll be back tomorrow in Edmonton, Canada. Thomas I. Reichness, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Stay tuned for Angela Belita with host Maricara Valesco. Thank you, Tom. Take care. You too. We'll see you tomorrow, Maricar. Na mapang mga panguna ng balita sa loob at labas ng bansa. Tinagit at kinalap ng Agila News Team. Agila Balita. Narito na ang may init na balita ngayon ay Huwebes, Hunyo 25, 2020 sa ulo ng mga balita. Senado at Department of Finance iniimbestigahan ang operasyon ng Philippine Offshore Gaming Operators o POGO kahit hindi umuno nagbabayad ng buwis. COVID-19 cases sa bansa lumampas na sa 32,000. DOH pinawi naman ang pangamba ng publiko na lumalala ang COVID-19 sa bansa. Tatlong Korean nationals na miyembro ng Voice Fishing Criminal Group na aresto ng mga miyembro ng PNP-CIDG sa Paranaque City. Sa ating balitang abroad, human error sa panig ng piloto at air traffic control dahilan umano ng pagbagsak ng eroplano sa Pakistan noong nakalipas na buwan na ikinasawi ng 77 katao. Ako ang inyong magiging tagapaghatid balita. Ako po si Maricar Velasco. Sa detalye ng mga balita, Senate Labor Committee sinisiyasat na kung bakit maraming nag-ooperate na Philippine Offshore and Gaming Operators sa bansa kahit hindi sila nagbabayad ng buwis. Senator Joel Villanueva pinangunahan ang pagdinig para alamin kung bakit pinapayagan ang mga pogo sa kanilang illegal na operasyon gayong dapat ay isinara na ang mga ito. Si Mayan Corvera sa detalye. Pinayagan umano ng gobyerno na muling makapag-operate ang maraming pogo o Philippine Offshore and Gaming Operators. Katunayan ayon kay Senador Joel Villanueva, dalawa pa lamang sa mga pogo company ang nakapagbayad ng buwis sa pamahalaan. Ito kahit may kondisyon ang gobyerno na payagan silang makapag-operate kapalit ng pagbabayad ng utang na buwis hanggang noong Abril. Ang katunayan niya na patuloy silang nakapag-ooperate ay ang seri ng pagkakaaresto sa mga illegal pogo workers habang naka-quarantine ang buong Luzon Region. Kabilang narito ang pagkakaaresto sa 53 pogo workers sa Paranaque noong April 24. Bukod pa rito ang 76 na naaresto naman sa Makati, 265 sa Las Piñas, at siyam na po dalawa sa Bacoor na nangyari bago matapos ang Mayo. These are foreigners uh, operating illegally in our country. And in fact, if you recall, uh, last year alone, hinuli ng Gole. Gole, uh, when they were doing their job in checking uh, this Pogo uh, legal to, ha? legal Pogo operations, when they were checking it out, They were able to uh, 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 have this data more than, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, oh, I, I got the data, 6,678. 6,678 illegal workers found working in legal pogo. Ang sa akin lang, klaro na may VIP treatment. Klaro na meron silang back, backers. Because... These guys will not do this na mga foreigners sila dito sa ating bansa kung wala silang mga uh, pinagkakatiwalaan o pinag-iisipan na oh kaya tayong protektahan. Ang komite ni Villanueva ang nag-imbestiga sa mga nagsilputang pogo sa bansa. Ayon sa senador, maglalabas sa sila ng komite reporting gil dito sa pagbabalik ng sesyon sa Hulyo. Pero magpapatawag pa sila ng isang pagdinig dahil marami pang kwestiyon ang mga kapwa sila sa mga na aktibidad ng POGO.
hanggat hindi tayo nagmamatigas, hanggat hindi nagmamatigas ang gobyerno na dapat silang magbayad ng buwis, I don't think magbabayad sila ng buwis. Kaya para sa akin, kung ganyan din lang, sarado na lang natin kung hindi natin kayang pigilan. Para sa si Eagle News, may Ancor Vera, we live in interesting times. Sa kaugnay na balita, iniimbestigahan na rin ng Department of Finance ang sinasabing hindi pagbabayad ng buwis ng maraming Philippine Offshore Gaming Operators o POGO. Sinabi ni Finance Secretary Sunny Dominguez, hindi sila nagpapabaya sa pagsilip sa obligasyon ng mga POGO operator na magbayad ng tax. Si Madeline Villar Muratilio sa detalye. May mga ginagawa ng investigasyon ang Department of Finance sa aligasyong maraming Philippine Offshore Gaming Operators o POGO ang hindi umano nagbabayad ng tamang buwis. Kaugnay nito, tiniyak ni Finance Secretary Sunny Dominguez na hindi sila nagpapabaya sa pagsilip sa obligasyon sa pagbayad ng buwis sa mga POGO operator. Pero aminadong kalihim na dahil sa banta ng COVID-19, limitado sa ngayon ang nagagawa ng kanilang mga tauhan. Hindi kasi aniya makalabas ang kanilang mga tauhan sa Bureau of Internal Revenue at Bureau of Customs para magsagawa ng mas malawakang investigasyon sa pogo operation sa buong bansa. We, we are conducting uh, investigations of those allegations. Uh, it's probably true, but you know also because of the lockdown, our people cannot really go around so much, eh. but we are monitoring. Una rito, sinabi ni Senate Labor Committee Chairman Joel Villanueva na dalawang pogo lamang ang nagbayad ng buwis mula ng payagang muling makapag-operate ang mga ito sa gitna ng COVID-19 pandemic. Ayon sa Senador, maraming pogo ang nagbukas na muli kahit na hindi pa nakakabayad ng tax obligation sa gobyerno. Una rito, pinayagan na ulit ng pamahalaan ng mga pogo na makapagbukas muli pero ang kondisyon, dapat magbayad muna sila ng buwis. Para sa Eagle News, Madeline Villar Muratilio, We Live in Interesting Times. Samantala, iginiit ng Department of Finance na nakasaat sa batas ang pagbabayad ng buwis ng mga online business at hindi ito inimbento lamang. Sinabi pa ng ahensya na ang batas na nag-oobliga na iparehistro ang online business ay hindi para i-pressure na magbayad ang small digital entrepreneurs. Si Orlo Binga sa detalye. Nakasaad sa implementing tax laws ang pagpaparehistro ng isang online business at obligasyon ito umano ng owner. Ayon kay Finance Secretary Carlos Dominguez, pinatuntupad nila ang batas sa pagbubuhis at hindi ito inimbento. Nakasaad sa BIR Revenue Memorandum Circular No. 60-2020 na lahat ng uri ng pagnenegosyo kahit sa pamamagitan ng digital transaction ay kinakailangan umanong nakarehistro upang maging tax compliant. Matatanda ang nilinaw ng Malacanang na ang mga negosyo na kumikita ng 250,000 pesos pababa kada taon ay exempted na sa pagbabayad ng buwis. Paglilinaw ng Finance Department, layo ng nasawing batas na may rehistro ang online business at hindi para i-pressure na magbayad ng buwis ang small digital entrepreneurs. Para sa Eagle News, Erlingas, we live in interesting times. Sinita at inisyuhan ng tiket ng PNP Highway Patrol Group ang ilang motorista na ginagawang parking space ang mga itinalagang bike lanes sa Metro Manila. Sa harap nito, nananawagan ng Joint Task Force COVID Shield sa mga motorista na irespeto at huwag sakupi ng linya para sa mga bisikleta. Ang detalye sa report ni Mar Gabriel. Umapila ang Joint Task Force COVID Shield sa mga motorista. Dawag sa kupin at gawing parking space sa mga itinalagang bike lanes. Ayon kay JTF COVID Shield Commander, Police Lieutenant General Guillermo Ilyasar, hindi lang ito kawalan ng respeto sa bike lanes, kundi paglalagay din sa panganib sa buhay ng mga nagbibisikleta. Dahil dito, nakipag-ugnayan ang Joint Task Force COVID Shield sa PNP Highway Patrol Group at mga local police para magsagawa ng clearing operation sa mga bike lanes sa Metro Manila. Agad namang sinuyod na mga tauhan ng HPG ang bike lane sa kahabaan ng Quezon Avenue at timog sa Quezon City. Ilang motorista ang nasita at naisyuhan ng citation ticket matapos gawing parking space ang bike lanes. Inobligan na rin ni General Eliasar ang mga local police na isama sa kanilang regular patrolling ang mga bike lanes upang masiguro na hindi ito ginagawang parking space o dinadaanan ng ibang motorista. Nakikipag-ugnayan na rin sila sa iba pang ahensya sa panukalang paglalagay ng barrier sa bike lanes upang ihiwalay sila sa ibang sasakyan. Bukod sa Quezon City, naglaan na rin ng bike lanes ang lungsod ng Pasig 
San Juan at Taguig. Pinag-aaralan naman ng MMDA ang paglalagay ng bike lane sa kahabaan ng EDSA sa harap ng patuloy na pagdami ng mga nagbibisikleta bilang alternatibong transportasyon sa gitna ng umiiral na community quarantine. Para sa Eagle News, Mar Gabriel, we live in interesting times. Isinabay sa pagunita ng Araw ng Maynila kahapon ang groundbreaking ceremony ng itatayong bagong ospital ng Maynila. Ang proyekto nagkakahalaga ng higit sa dalawang bilyong piso. Ang lumang gusali naman ng ospital ng Maynila ay gagawing College of Medicine ng pamantasan ng lungsod ng Maynila. Si Madeline Villar Moratilio sa detalye. Sisimula na ang pagtatayo ng bago at modernong ospital ng Maynila. Kanina kasabay ng pagdiriwang ng 449th founding anniversary ng Maynila, pinangunahan ni na Mayor Isko Moreno at Vice Mayor Hani Lacuna ang groundbreaking ceremony para sa itatayong bagong ospital. Kaugay nito tiniyak ni Moreno na sa ilalim ng kanyang pamumuno, hindi manghinayang ang lokal na pamahalaan na pondohan ang pangangailangan na mga healthcare workers sa lungsod. Katunayan, hanggang ngayon ay patuloy ani ang kanilang pag-hire ng mga health workers upang matiyak na may sapat na bilang ng mga tauhan ang lahat ng ospital at barangay health center sa Maynila. We have the best doctors, nurses in hospital ng Maynila. We have the best doctors and health workers and nurses in our six hospitals, in our health centers. But no matter how best they are, if they have limited equipment, tools, and facility na hindi na naaayon sa hamon ng panahon at pangangailangan ng panahon. It's high time for our hospital ng Maynila, medical personnel, to have the best public hospital building and facility with modern equipment. Ang itatayong bagong ospital ng Maynila ay mayroong 10 palapag at mayroong 384 bed capacity. Mayroon itong 12 intensive care units at 20 private rooms, tatlong palapag na parking building at helipad. Ang proyekto ay nagkakahalaga ng 2.3 billion pesos. Itatayo ito katabi ng lumang gusali ng ospital na gagawin namang College of Medicine ang pamantasan ng lungsod ng Maynila. Sa pamamagitan nito, ang mga medicine student ng PLM hindi na rin kailangang bumiyahi pa mula sa intramuros patungo sa ospital. Para sa Igal News, Madeline Villar Moratilio, We Live in Interesting Times. Susunod, COVID-19 cases sa bansa umaabot na sa 32,295. Ang detalye na yan sa pagbabalik ng Agila Balita sa umaga. Agila. Agila. Patindi ng patindi at tuloy-tuloy ang pagpapakita ng galing ng ating mga TNG aspirants. Abangan ng kanilang performances sa pinakamalaking talent competition sa buong bansa, Tagisan ng Galing. Tagisan ng Galing is presented by SMC Infrastructure, Building a Better World. Sandig Sugar-Free White Coffee, puno ng white coffee taste without the sugar, kaya lower calories. Try mo na, Sandig Sugar-Free White Coffee, sarap ng white coffee, now sugar-free. VetaBrew NutriChops, the only premium dog food with active boost for optimum energy and prebiotics that helps strengthen immunity. Just like Catherine Bernardo, gawing listo, ganado ang fur babies niyo. Listo ganado sa NutriChops. Magnolia Chicken Templados, delicious, ready to cook and freshly marinated daily. Pure Foods Lunch and Meat, pure sarap for every family. Star Chunky Cheese Corn Beef, ang cheesy ng corn beef mo. Walang duda, kids can tell na number one ang Pure Foods Tender Juicy. Ang tender, ang juicy, ang sarap. Co-presented by Cooper, expert in air conditioning and electromechanical. Also engaged in structural, electrical, fire protection. Plumbing and sanitary services. Cooper, your ultimate MEPS and air conditioning solutions. Ulan Incorporated International, fight against global poverty.
do San Jose Builders Incorporated. Canrib Corporation, your ventilation and air conditioning specialist. Vita Herbs Philippines Green Coffee, masarap, mabango, at healthy pa. Puerto Rico Resort and Convention Center, Cabiao, Nueva Ecija. I love Puerto Rico. In participation with Rain or Shine Elastomeric Waterproofing Paint, Matinko, R Square Variables Incorporated, Compizel Enterprises, SciShow International Trading Corporation, DN Steel, EMAC UPB Roof Corporation. Hey, Gretchen Ho here, and I'm a white coffee lover. Creamy kasi, and very yummy. Pero mas masarap kung hindi nakaka-guilty. Check my new discovery, Sand May Sugar Free White Coffee. Puno ng white coffee taste without the sugar, kaya no more calories. Try mo na! Sand May Sugar Free White Coffee. Sarap ng white coffee, now sugar free. The successful development of TPLEX or Tarlac Pangasinan La Union Expressway in 2009, a four-lane toll road that extends from Tarlac City to Rosario La Union with an additional approved extension of 56 kilometers all the way to San Juan La Union. This is expected to reduce travel time to Baguio and other provinces in northern Luzon. Realizing the vision of creating a better world for Filipinos fueled the team's focus. Listo at ganado ang baby ko sa VET-approved Nutri-Chunks. With active boost and prebiotics na pampalisto. Made with real meat, with essential nutrients to help them grow healthy and happy. Listo, ganado sa Nutri-Chunks. Ikaw lang ang star ng buhay ko. Para sa akin, perfect ka. Ang cheesy ng corned beef mo. Pag star chunky cheese corned beef, sarap ng corned beef, inangat pa ng real cheese cubes. Star Chunky Cheese Corned Beef. Lumampas na sa 32,000 ang kaso ng coronavirus disease 2019 sa bansa. Umaabot na ngayon sa 32,295 ang COVID-19 cases sa bansa matapos na makapagtala ang Department of Health ng karagdagan ng 470 bagong kaso. Sa bagong bilang na ito ay 357 ang fresh cases habang 130 naman ang date cases. Sa mga fresh cases, 159 ang mula sa National Capital Region, 141 sa Region 7, ang 50 7 naman ay mula sa iba pang lugar sa bansa. Sa mga late cases naman, ang 66 ay mula sa NCR, apat mula sa Region 7 at 43 naman sa iba pang lugar sa bansa. May naitala namang 240 na naka-recover mula sa sakit. Dahil dito, umaakyat na o umakyat na sa 8,656 ang bilang ng mga pasyenteng gumaling mula sa virus. May labing walo namang naitala ng karagdagang nasawi dahil sa COVID-19. Paglilinaw naman ng DOH, ang labing apat sa labing walong ito ay nasawi noong June 4 hanggang June 17, 2020 pa, ngunit ngayon lamang na-validate. Sa ngayon, umabot na sa 1,204 ang kabuang bilang ng nasawi sa bansa dahil sa COVID-19. Pinawi ng Department of Health ang pangamba ng publiko na muli na namang lumalala ang COVID-19 situation sa bansa. Kasunod ito ng 1,150 na karagdagang kaso ng COVID-19 na kanilang iniulat nitong nakaraang araw o noong June 23. Sa 1,150 na bagong kaso na ito ay 789 ng fresh cases o mga kasong na itala sa nakalipas na tatlong araw. Ayon kay Health USEC Maria Rosario Vergere, bagang matumataas ang kaso ng virus infection ay 96.2% dito ang mild lamang, habang 0.5% ang severe at 0.1% ang critical. Pero kahit na mayorya ng COVID-19 cases sa bansa ay mild lamang, nagpaalala si Vergere na hindi dapat maging kampante ang lahat. Pagamat tumataas ang mga kaso, we can see that based on our data from June 23, 96.2% of the cases are mild cases. Samantala, only 0.5% ang severe cases at 0.1% ang critical cases. Ibig sabihin, mataas ang porsyento na makaka-recover tayo sa sakit na ito. Mataas man ang mild cases, let me remind everyone that we can never be complacent here. 
Habang wala pa pong bakuna para sa COVID-19, siguraduhin natin na hindi natin ito maiuwi sa ating bahay at maihahawa sa ating mga kapamilya. Importante pa rin po ang palagi ang pag-ugas ng kamay, disinfection and sanitation, and physical distancing. Off-site dormitories para sa medical frontliners handa nang i-turn over ng DPWH sa Quezon City Government. Mga kagamitan, tiniyak na ligtas at kumpleto para sa komportabling paninirahan ng mga health workers. Si Eden Santos sa detalye. Halos tapos at kompleto ng Wihilas 1 off-site dormitory sa loob ng Quezon City Circle na ipinatayo ng Department of Public Works and Highways. Binisita ng Net25 News ang mga dormitoryo para sa mga health workers mula sa iba't ibang ospital sa Quezon City tulad ng National Kidney and Transplant Institute, Philippine Heart Center, East Avenue Medical Center, Veterans Memorial Hospital, Children's Hospital at Viluna General Hospital. Ipinasilip sa amin ang isa sa dormitoryo na kumpleto sa mga bagong pasilidad. Ang bawat kwarto ay may sariling comfort room, hot and cold shower, double deck, aircon at iba pa. Ayon kay Hiner Sanchez, project manager sa kinuhang subcontractor ng DPWH, handa ng tatlo sa anim na clusters ng off-site dormitories para i-turn over sa Quezon City government sa katapusan ng Hunyo. Uh, so far yung end of June na yan, June 30 natin, ang turnover natin sa circle is three cluster, sa lang center is one. So apat na cluster dito sa June 30, ang naka-target natin na may turnover. So talaga yung mga health workers natin dito, as in mag stay siya, uh, parang lumalabas, damit na lang ang dala niya eh. So talaga complete na. Complete, uh, complete amenities yung ano na tutulugan niya. Parang yung tarang nag stay ka ng kondo, na nag ka ng kondo, na damit mo lang ang dala mo eh. Diba? Complete siya. Ganun ang setup namin dito. Sa dormitory na nakaprovide sa health workers natin. Comfortable talaga lahat na mag stay Maluwag at may mga kagamitan din sa magsisilbing mess hall ng dormitoryo. So ang living na nakaset up, meron tayong tatlong dining. Yung uh, living area natin may kanya-kanyang TV na nakadesign. Bukod pa dyan, meron tayong alam ko, sa expected ko na nakapropose dito, meron dalawang desktop na nakaprovide dito sa mess hall nila. So ito naman mesal naman, meron tayong dalawang aircon na nakaprovide na three tanner yung left and right natin. Diba? So pagkakaalam ko, meron pa siya, magkakaroon siya ng uh, press air. Eh. So yan, yung ano natin. Ito yung uh, amenities natin. Tapos may kitchen at may laundry. Tiniyak din ang kontraktor na nakasunod sa health protocols na itinakda ng Interagency Task Force ang mga dorm upang matiyak na ligtas at hindi kakalat ang virus na sanhi ng COVID-19. At siyempre, di ba galing sila sa labas, galing sa hospital? Iyon kasi di ba may mga flooring na mga vinyl na ordinary lang. Pero ito kasi hindi ordinary kasi ito na tinatawag na antibacterial na talagang uh, wala siyang kumakawal. Wala yung bacteria natin na uh, safe sila. Yun ang ano natin. Kasi dito, like dito, may sanitation area tayo. Nandun sa protocol ni Ayotip. Gawang galing ka sa labas, dito ka sa entrance sa uh, papasok, may sanitation area. So, pag uh, lalabas ka naman, meron siya namang exit door. Hindi siya magsasalubong. O, ganun ang way. Meron siyang ano, di ba? Ganun naman ang setup ngayon ni Ayotip, eh, di ba? Kahit saan ka po, iba yung entrance, iba yung exit. So, nasusunod naman yung mga ganong protocol. Maaari rin naman ng magluto at maglabang mga titirang health workers dahil kompleto rin sa kagamitan ang kitchen at laundry areas. Para sa Eagle News, Eden Santos, we live in interesting times. Kapwa papaubos na ang pondo o trust fund ng Overseas Workers Welfare Administration maging ng Department of Foreign Affairs na ginagamit na pantulong sa mga distressed Filipino overseas workers dahil na rin sa nararanasang COVID-19 pandemic. Sa pagdinig ng Senado, kapwa umaapela ang dalawang ahensya na dagdagan ang kanilang pondo na ipantutulong sa mga OFWs. Si Mayan Corvera sa detalye. Nanganganib na mabangkarote ang trust fund ng Overseas Workers Welfare Administration kung magpapatuloy ang krisis dulot ng COVID-19. 
Sa pagdinig ng Senate Committee on Labor, sinabi ni OWA Administrator Hans Kakdak, malaking pondo na kasi ang kanilang nagagastos para sa repatriation at pagpapauwi sa mga overseas Filipino workers na nawala ng trabaho sa buong mundo dulot ng pandemic. Sa datos ng OWA, umaabot na sa mahigit 50,000 ang mga umuuwing OFWs. Katunayan sa kasalukuyan, 18 billion na lang ang pondo ng OWA na maaring bumaba pa sa 10 billion sa pagtatapos ng 2020. Mag-ooperate daw sila sa less than 1 billion na pondo kung matutuloy pa ang pag-uwi ng may isang daan at 50,000 mga overseas Filipino workers. Okay. Uh, you're saying that uh, mababangkarota po ang OWA by the end of 2021. Yes po. Yes, po. yes po, sir. Assuming all the factors currently present continue, yeah. uh, declining income, more OFWs come uh, down. We have to sustain this fund uh, in order to, for the benefit of our OFWs. If you're saying that by the end of next year, you will, you will have less than one billion in your trust funds, that's not a very uh, good news. Although I was looking at your presentation that you submitted, eh, dito, you, you appear to be to have funds until end of 2023. Uh, uh, May 1.8 billion, but you're saying that by, this, by next year, uh, 2021, December, you will have less than 1 billion. Bukod kasi anya sa 10,000 na financial assistance, ang OWA ang sumasagot sa gastusin ng lahat ng mga umuwing OFWs. Kasama na rito ang pagkain, hotel accommodation para sa quarantine at chartered bus of flights pa uwi sa kanilang mga probinsya at overseas food assistance ng may tinatayang 70,000 na mga migrant workers. 2.5 billion naman anya sa kanilang pondo na kalaan na para sa financial assistance at scholarship program ng mga manggagawa. Bukod dito, tinatayang gagastos pa sila ng 4 hanggang 5 billion pesos sa mga susunod na buwan para mapauwi pa ang natitirang mga manggagawang Pinoy. Hindi raw maaring asahan ng kanilang koleksyon sa mga OFWs dahil marami rin ang nawala ng trabaho. Bukod sa OWA, paubos na rin ang pondo ng Department of Foreign Affairs pantulong sa mga distressed OFWs. Ayon kay DFA Undersecretary Sara Lou Ariola, ang DFA ang tumutulong sa mga apektadong Pinoy sa may 57 mga bansang walang kinatawan ng Polo at OWA. Sa kanilang pondo ngayong taon, 66% na ang nagamit at pinangangambahang mauubos bago matapos ang Agosto ngayong taon. Haabot pa kasi anya sa mahigit 167 na mga apektadong OFWs ang kailangan nilang mapauwi sa bansa sa susunod na dalawa hanggang tatlong buwan. The assistance to national fund of 1 billion of the DFP has been overstretched already. Uh, we have spent as of June 23, 66% of our fund. And we are afraid if we continually charter the, um, the place, because there are a lot more people who are stranded, that our funds will run out by the end of August. And uh, actually, Your Honors, uh, the assistance to national fund is not only for COVID-19. In fact, um, We did not foresee that there was going to be a COVID-19. That's why we have been overspending and we have spent almost $197 million um, uh, for COVID-19 assistance. Kapwa humihingi ng supplemental funds ang OWA at TFA para masuportahan pa ang gastusin sa pagpapauwi ng mga apektadong Pinoy. May panukala na si Senator Franklin Drillon na paamiyandahan ang charter ng OWA para magamit ang kanilang trust fund sa pag-invest sa mga GOCCs gaya ng SSS at GSIS. Uh, income, example, SSS and GSIS. Uh, the, these two agencies would have a similar uh, nature as you have trust, but they earn higher in, uh, income. Uh, because of the investment. Yes, sir. So, Samantala kinumpirma ng Dole na abot sa isang daan at pitong overseas Filipino workers ang namatay sa Saudi Arabia dahil sa COVID pandemic. Pero ayon kay Labor Secretary Silvestre Bello, hindi na iuwi sa Pilipinas ang bangkay ng mga biktima kundi ililibing na sa naturang bansa. Nakikipag-usap na anya sila sa pamilya ng mga biktima at ipiniliwanag ang sitwasyon sa posibleng kontaminasyon at paglaganap pa ng virus 
kung iuwi sila sa bansa. Para sa Eagle News, may Ancor Vera will live in interesting time. Naaresto sa operasyon ng PNP Criminal Investigation and Detection Group ang tatlong Korean Nationals na miyembro ng Voice Fishing Criminal Group sa barangay San Isidro, Paranaque City. Nakilala ang mga suspect na sina Hyok Su Kwon, Dong Woo Sim at Yong Jun Lim na nahuli sa akto habang nakikipagtransaksyon sa kanilang mga posibleng biktima. Na-rescue naman ng CIDG ang biktimang si Gun Si Lee na bagong recruit ng grupo. Ikinulong siya ng mga suspect matapos Tapos na madiskubre na nagbibigay ito ng impormasyon sa mga otoridad ukol sa ilegal na aktibidad ng grupo. Base sa investigasyon, modus ng grupo na mambiktima ng mga kapwa koreano na tinatawagan nila at hinihikayat na mag-invest o mag-loan pero hinihingan lang nila ang mga ito ng processing fee at hindi na magpaparamdam. Nabawi sa mga suspect ang ilang landline telephone, wifi modem at ilang dokumento. Iniahanda na ng CIDG ang mga kasong kriminal na isasampalaban sa mga suspect kabilang ang Serious Illegal Detention at Paglabag sa Cyber Crime Prevention Act of 2012. Mga pangyayari sa labas ng bansa, Balitan Abroad! Human error umuno sa padding ng piloto at air traffic control ang dahilan ng pagbagsak ng eroplano sa Pakistan noong nakalipas na buwan na ikinasawi ng 77 katao. Ito ang lumabas sa isinasagawang investigasyon ng mga otoridad. Magugunit ang bumagsak sa mga kabahayan ng isang eroplano ng Pakistan International Airlines noong Mayo 22 matapos masira ang dalawang makina nito habang papalapit ng Karachi Airport. Sinabi ni Pakistan Aviation Minister Gulam Sarwar Khan na kapwa hindi sinunod ng piloto at ng air controller ang standard rules. Anya, pinag-uusapan ng mga piloto ang, ng eroplano ang uh, ukol sa coronavirus pandemic habang nagmamaneuver para sa paglabag ng Airbus A320. Sinabi ng opisyal na kapwa hindi nakapokus ang pilot at ang kanyang co-pilot sa kanilang ginagawa. At yan ang naging kabuuan ng ating may init na balita. Sa pangalan ng ating mga kaagapay sa Eagle News Service, ako po si Maricar Velasco and we live in interesting times. Susunod na ang programang sa ganang mamamayan kasama si na Congressman Dante Marcoleta at Chenzo Barjaga. Sumayin niyo ang mga balitang ginagawa, mainit na isinunan at inihanay ng Eagle News Service. Agila Balita! Huwag tayong mag-alala. Kung ganito man, kalala ang problema ng mundo, 